Madisonian back in our midst here, Jillian Talarczyk, who <laughs> is founder uh, and, and chief creative officer for the Madison Public Art Project. And this is a project that is relatively new, but has had real uh, influence in the first couple of projects, namely in, is it a flower flash? I always forget the exact term. Uh, yes. Over yes, a little it bit, was. It was an amazing flower presentation at, outside of the library last summer. And we're hoping that this is going to be more projects. Art, public art in particular, are so important to downtown and to the economic development of downtown. This is a huge sector in our uh, downtown economy. So we're excited about projects like this and what Emoka is doing with the new statue going up in the next couple of days. There's a lot of amazing public art happening here. So Jillian, it's great to see you. Although I don't think you're in Madison today, but you are you are a Madisonian through and through. Welcome. Hi. I am always back and forth on flights. So thank you so much for having me. My name is Jillian Tillarchik. I am the president of the Madison Public Art Project. We're a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, I do bring 20 years of New York City art consulting um, experience to this business. And I am a Madisonian, um, born and raised. Of course, I love the downtown district. One of my favorite places, um, drinks at Eno Vino and pizza at Paisans and the farmer's market and everything that State Street brings um, are all some of my favorite places. I'm excited to be here today. Thank you, Jason, and to DMI. Thank you to everyone for having me. I'd like to do a brief Q&A at the end, um, if that's okay. So with that, um, let's begin. This is the mission statement of our organization, specifically to foster innovative contemporary art projects. Uh, we're, 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 not, we're not, we're not seeing, I'm sorry to cut you off. We're not seeing the presentation. Oh, wonderful. It worked when we tried in practice. I know, of course it did. <laughs> All righty, well, let's see. try it again. There we go. I think we're on the way. There we go. We got it now. Perfect. Okay. So let's move on to, can you see the mission statement? We can see it perfectly, Jillian. Okay. Uh, to foster innovative contemporary art projects, strengthening communities with engaging art. We do support both emerging and established artists, and we do rely heavily on corporations, grants, um, individual donors and community support, including in-kind contributions. All of our projects are different um, and in their own way, they do inspire imagination, civic participation and fuel artistic development, creating a connection between the artists and the local communities. So just to touch on some of our most recent projects, uh, Jason did mention one of them earlier. We, in 2020, completed a large exterior, exterior 13 by 60 foot mural wall. This was a site specific installation. This was um, the very beginning of COVID, September of 2020, installed at 701 East Johnson Street at the corner of North Blount. It was um, and is a self-service laundry building. We were able to support four local artists with this initiative. And this is what it looked like. Super colorful. Um, I think that the projects speak to the high caliber of work that we're doing. The inspiration for this mural was based off an art prank, which many of you probably know. Um, it started in 1979 when a student filled up Bascom Hill with these um, pink flamingos. Now it's called the Fill the Hill tradition and it is the largest fundraiser for the University of Wisconsin-Madison, which is vital to their success. Uh, that fundraiser is sponsored each year by the UW Alumni Association. So I think this is really an example of a mural that celebrates community traditions, placemaking, and city pride. In fact, the plastic flamingo prank turn tradition became so popular that in 2015, the Madison Common Council declared the plastic flamingo the official city bird of Madison. And subsequently in 2018, Forward Madison, the professional soccer club unveiled their bird as their official logo and the fan club adopted the name, The Flock. So of course we were very excited to support this project. For any of you that like, pop art and color, there is a ton of life and vitality 
and energy in this piece. And thank you to Amber who captured this um, installation shot. We were featured in the state journal here. Lots of um, parents that visited to photograph their children. We had many, many visitors and still do. They were talking about art crawls through Madison, um, posting pictures with their children, checking out Madison's growing mural art collection, which is very exciting. All, um, all ages, all seasons, see some wonderful fashion shoot um, things that people did. You see some visitors that were bundled up in the winter time. This, um, unfortunately, this mural was defaced last year um, due to graffiti, but we, as the Madison Public Art Project, organized a community paint day. We had a group of local volunteers that came and repainted the walls. So now I'm happy to report that it is looking as vibrant and beautiful as ever. Wonderful shots here of the snow. Um, I particularly love this piece with the white backdrop and that wonderful reflection. Looks so amazing after a heavy rainfall. So then this is actually the um, flower flash that was referenced earlier, we were able to commission Molly Stentz, a local flower farmer. And this is actually about the time that I met Jason. We partnered with the Madison Public Library. This was June 6. And this was a 72 hour, uh, very ephemeral installation. But I think that it's important to note that projects like this, they do sort of take on a life of their own that out, outlast the, um, the installation itself. This was the first week that the library reopened services. So if we look back, you know, this was a time that people were just starting to emerge out of these uh, COVID-19 stay at home orders. And the flowers served as source material. Um, clearly flowers have the ability to evoke a myriad of emotions that connect the human experience. And this really was the Madison Public Art Project's response to COVID-19. Um, it was created to uplift community spirits. And it also coordinated with the library resuming their services. So just imagine showing up to work and um, having this be your view after being in isolation for so long. So that was wonderful for all of the neighbors, all of the library workers, and all of the businesses that were located in the downtown district. These were living flowers. Um, these were ephemerals that Molly grew on her farm. So you're looking at bright pink peonies, foxglove, sweet william, hardy evergreen, spires of foxglove, spurea, and these wonderful cascading branches. Another cool shot that was by John Hart. Thank you. State Journal. I was actually just blown away by all of the visitors that came to support this project. We had amazing weather. I think it hit 80 degrees one day. So uh, the flowers did drink a lot of water. Some behind the scenes uh, picture there in the middle, that's Molly with her assistant. And um, we even had some special visitors from nature. If there's any nature lovers in the group, the um, bed was perfect for a little bumblebee on the right side there to take his nap and a dragonfly that came to say hello on the left side there. So not just humans that enjoy this installation, which of course is typical when you place art outside in the public realm. I'm gonna see if I can play this short clip. Can you guys see that? Yep. Or we could see your screen. I think you're trying to play the clip. Yeah, I don't see the yeah, actual video though. Clip. 
Oh, okay. That's too bad. You have to open it up in a separate video. And then when you reshare your screen, click to optimize for sound and for video. Okay. Um, you can probably put it in the chat for people to watch later too. Yeah, that's probably beyond me. All right, let me get out of that. How do I go back? Sorry, bear with me. Can you see that? You're no longer sharing. No, yes. Ugh. Good night. Don't worry, we've all been there. <laughs> Such a pain. Yes, literally, I think everyone on this call has been there. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> Oh, I really wanted to share that, but that's okay. I'm gonna send the link in a separate. Can you see that? We yeah, yeah we see your we see the mission statement now. Okay, all right. I'm gonna send that link um, to Jason for those of you that may want to see that in a separate link. Thank you. It's fun. It just kind of brings it all to life a little bit more. So there was also a couple that um, celebrated their 45 year anniversary, which was very special. And I think that the main thing to just keep in mind is that sharing these images really demonstrates it was an important public art piece that really did serve the community, uh, serving as a positive reminder to keep loving, growing, dreaming, breathing, and offered hope during a very difficult time. My favorite time to visit was actually uh, at night because the letters of the library illuminate. So it became a very special time to visit. It looked very magical with all of these intertwined florals and illuminated letters. So I'm including a beautiful detailed shot there as well as this wonderful view as bikers and walkers and people driving by got to enjoy the flash. So if there's any art collectors in the group or if anyone's looking for gifts that celebrate Madison uh, for holidays or loved ones, we do now offer archival collector photo prints, which are available in three sizes, celebrating this installation. They were all printed locally in Wisconsin. You can always reach out to me uh, to purchase. The prints are absolutely gorgeous and they come in three sizes. We have a new project that we just announced a few weeks ago. Super excited about Canopy Understories. This is a public art sculpture series. This is going to be presented in collaboration with the UW Madison Arboretum. And it features the work of Laura Richards and William Grant Turnbull. These are two local Madison based artists and um, also UW alumni. Uh, as am I, and we're fabricating four aluminum sculptures that are gonna be larger than life, uh, blown up, playing with scale. They're gonna highlight the native plant species of the Arboretum, in particular, the state tree, which is um, the sugar maple. So I hope that you all have a chance to visit and including some wonderful artist rendering um, early from the process to share with you these conceptual drawings. This was me with the artists um, during a site visit. And of course, we're thrilled to work with the UW Arboretum to promote this interaction within the natural landscape. We're projecting thousands of visitors that will be able to attend. The installation will be on view for one year. And the Arboretum is known for their research and educational excellence. So we're thrilled to be partnering together with them. The project highlights how the tools and technology of the modern world can be more sustainable. So I hope that you all can visit uh, to see how is this translated into this sculpture series and you'll have a year to do that. So that'll be wonderful. I'm gonna see if this one will play. Can you hear that? We no? can see it, but we cannot hear it. Oh, can you a little see the bit. pictures? Yes, we can. The video is a uh, glass blower.
some um, behind the scenes shots there by uh, Laura Richards in the studio last week. She was um, blowing glass, which is gonna be one component of one of the sculptures in that series. Of course, if you want more behind the scenes action um, shots, you can follow at Madison Public Art Project where we'll be giving weekly glimpses into this process leading up to the sculpture unveiling in April. Uh, you are all invited and I will send the committee um, an invite once that is published and ready. Another exciting project coming up. This is going to be unveiling this September. Um, for this, we're going to be partnering with the Monona Fire Department and the City of Monona. This is called Vibrant Hydrant, and the goal of these colorful painted hydrants is to uplift spirits of those who pass by and offer a collective remembrance to September 11th, commemorating those we lost and taking steps towards a more inclusive and peaceful world. We'll be commissioning 15 artists for the inaugural round of this program and we'll be having an artist RFP published through our website looking to artists that have been historically underrepresented in the arts world, including but not limited to BIPOC female or female identifying LGBTQIA plus disabled and or veteran artists. And we will be working with local businesses. Um, if you know anyone, either artists, um, businesses or homeowners, of course, we would love to meet them. We feel that this hydrant project will support a greater understanding and interest in arts and culture, as well as drawing new guests to the city. It'll also offer a professional artist opportunity for a diverse group of artists that maybe have not worked previously in the public realm, which I'm very excited to uh, work with them. And that I think very much speaks to placemaking as do all of our projects. This is placemaking um, as defined by the National Endowment of the Arts, which I would think is important to include because Again, this is sort of the underlying goal of all of our projects to align uh, with these efforts that ultimately lead, laying the groundwork through the lens of public art, which ultimately lead to systems change. So we will actually be holding a parade of hydrants on um, September 11th falls on a Sunday this year as a collective remembrance and we'll be um, at the firehouse. We'll have the artist in attendance speaking to the inspiration behind their project, why they wanted to be part of this. And um, after that, we'll be holding bike and walking tours as a way to extend interest to people that may wanna hear a little bit more uh, directly from the artists. Again, you'll be able to sign up on these through our website giving the community more options to interact with public art. So that's it. That's all I have. Um, again, there's more in the pipeline uh, that I can't quite talk about yet, but hopefully <laughs> you'll invite me back because there'll be lots more to say. If you have any questions, this is my cell and this is my email. Um, this is the link to donate through this QR code. 100% of the donations go to our charity, which is through the arm of PayPal for 501c3 nonprofits. We accept personal and business donations. And if any of you want to talk more directly, you know, if you have a wall, if you have an idea, if this sparked something in you that you want to engage in a deeper dialogue about, please do reach out. I would love to hear from you. I think that there's a lot of opportunity in the downtown district to, um, like Jason said earlier, promote economic development through the arts, which uh, certainly aligns with our mission statement. And I would be delighted to speak further. Thank you so much. Uh, Jillian, this is just tremendous work in so many of these projects downtown. Can't wait to see what the future ones are. It just brings people downtown What's my favorite phrase? An Instagrammable moment. I don't even know what that means, but it is great because it draws people downtown and it shows, you know, out downtown is for everybody and art is the best way to, to do that. Uh, we're running short on time, but if you have questions, you've got Jillian's email there. You can send them over to me as well and I can make sure to get those to you. But Jillian, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all you do. We can't wait to see your next projects and hopefully many of them are downtown. So thank you very much, Jillian. <laughs>
That would be great. Thank you so much. All right. Next up, so we've got uh, multiple presentations here today. We are very excited for our next presentation on NOAA, Natural Occurring Affordable Housing, with two great friends of DMI. First, we have Claire Electric, the Executive Director of Sustain Dane, and we have Abby Corso, the Chief Strategy Officer with Elevate here to give a presentation on NOAA. A uh, big topic here in downtown and around in our community. And we'll have a few minutes left at the end for your questions. But I think I'm sending it to Claire or Abby, both. Both, both. Hi, Jason. Thank you. And thank you, Julian. That was so beautiful and uplifting. Um, look forward to walking you through our presentation today. Um, we're going to split the presentation. So I'll talk for the first half, and then Abby will jump in for the second. So, Abby, why don't you start by introducing Elevate, and then I'll introduce Sustain Day and go from there. Sure. Thanks, Claire. And, um, and thanks for having us here today. Um, um, Elevate is a DMI member. We're really um, happy and, and excited. Uh, real newer, a newer member. And we are a nonprofit organization. Um, we are um, really focused on affordable housing and um, making sure that um, clean energy, especially in affordable housing, is available to, to everyone. So we take our commitment to equity pretty pretty seriously. Um, we have a small team here in Madison um, working um, with Sustained Dane to, um, to upgrade housing. Um, we have uh, folks in Michigan, Missouri, and, and California and Oregon with most of our staff being in the Chicago area. So we're about 160 strong right now. So Claire? Thanks, Abby. And I'm Clara Lekshak, Executive Director of Sustain Dane, Dane for Dane County. Uh, we've also been around for about 20 years. Our mission is to inspire, connect, and support people to accelerate equity and sustainable actions for community well-being. That's a bit of a mouthful, um, but what we what we kind of really kind of hone in on is what we call holistic sustainability. So in the business world, you often hear about like people, profits, and planet. Uh, we talk about as environmental health, equity, social well-being, and a just economy and the interconnections between those, which is uh, really demonstrated by this work that we're doing with Elevate. So Efficiency Navigator is what we've named the program. Uh, NOAA, Naturally Occurring Affordable Housing, <laughs> is a mouthful, um, but that is the sector uh, that we are running the Efficiency Navigator program in. So we are focused on helping small to medium-sized multifamily housing become more efficient and resilient while reducing those operating costs to help it remain affordable. Um, when we look at you know, eligibility for this subset, we're, um, we focus on residents that are at or below about 80% of the area median income based on census data. We also look at what rents are charged um, and buildings that are not part of an affordable housing subsidy program and with this all being renter occupied. So this is kind of a subset that for a long time has not been touched by a lot of the efficiency programs. Um, you know, a lot of challenges to work in this sector and really important to start focusing and putting um, our attention and our resources towards it. The need has four areas, uh, housing resilience. We have an affordable housing shortage in Dane County need to continue building and preserving and investing in our existing stock is our perspective for this work. Also looking at equity, research shows that for working families, rent, utility, transportation are costs that are among the highest of the monthly expenses. And when you link that with climate change, research shows that affordable housing tends to consume on average about 33% more energy than market rate because it's generally older, hasn't been upgraded or possibly deferred maintenance. And then there's an access um, need here because uh, it, it, we want to decrease the time, right? It takes time and effort uh, to do this work um, and to access the benefits and incentives available. So we spent about a year, year and a half, starting with stakeholder research um, as we kind of develop this for the Dane County region. Um, lots of you know, sense analysis and meeting with um, both the utilities, the um, owners, a lot of multifamily owners we talked with. So I wanna run, run you through a little bit of what the data shows us. So um, outreach focus, looking at that 80% AMI based on census areas, shows us that we have about 58,000 um, total households and then of those, the multifamily portion is about 68% of it, about 40,000. Um, so these in the map here, you can see kind of shaded what that looks like on, on a map for the, the regions. Then looking at the housing stock, about 230,000 housing units based on the American Community Survey, 
half of them, a little over half, single family detached. The other half is you know, multifamily. Um, so it's you know about 50% of what we're looking at for the housing market. Then combining the, the two of these, this graph we show is looking at what the NOAA sector is. So the blue line is the total for each of the type of housing. That orangish color is market rate. And then the yellow, that's the NOAA sector. So that's the unsubsidized affordable. So about 25% of the total housing stock in Dane County, we would identify as NOAA. And that's one plus units. So duplexes are included in this. And then 67% of the available affordable housing stock is NOAA. So NOAA programs um, are happening across the country. Um, we also spent time um, working with and talking with these other cities. We're still in communications with them. It, it's a bit of a growing area, a newer area, I'd say, for enough communities. But here are some stars to show other places around the country that are really starting to focus on and prioritize this work. And the components of the Sufficiency Navigator program uh, fall into a number of different buckets that uh, are each their own workflow and all are really critical to combine together. So assessments, so energy assessments and education is where this starts. And um, the buildings do get a energy assessment. Um, uh, Abby's team at Elevate, their engineers are the ones conducting those. Uh, we do have some partners also um, in the region. Then doing upgrades themselves, so energy, water, and health upgrades. Rooftop solar is, is included in the assessments we provide. Oftentimes, though, that's a longer, um, it's a longer item to start planning for with the owners um, as we get the efficiency done and then can look at rooftop solar. We also have been doing some demonstration work with resident resiliency. And we tie this back to how is this helping residents in multifamily units? Uh, we worked with Commonwealth Development last year in a pilot that included residents receiving a $600 um, financial contribution to start a savings account with a combination of both financial education and energy efficiency education with kind of thoughts about how that creates resiliency because oftentimes it is 300, 400, 500 dollars that can make the difference between someone being able to stay in their home or not. So providing that base as well as an opportunity for growing that as you see energy efficiency benefits of reducing bills. Diverse contractors. This is another important part to us in this program. And we're going to talk later in the presentation a little more about that. But as we're doing this work, how, how are we able to support and include diverse contractors? There is financing for um, this work. Um, oftentimes the focus on energy benefits um, are good and important and not enough. So we're aware of that and we are developing a, a micro loan. So for those smaller amounts, you know, under kind of $50,000, um, that, that loan amount, being able to provide an offering for that. And then the last one is community partners. It's not just us and Elevate. We are working with community partners. Um, we feel that's really important as we connect with different neighborhoods and, um, and have people within the neighborhoods that are supporting this work as well. This is a different way to show a kind of graphic property over and going through this process and then the navigator and energy um, engineer supporting. Because at each of these points, you can drop off. It takes time, right? It takes focus. And there's tons of things that are going on in everyone's different days. And a lot of the owners that we're working with, this is not their first job. This is a you know, property they have in addition to something else they're doing. So what we're looking at to decrease barriers, um, the limited awareness of programs, so having a single point of contact to support owners through this process, um, having the data with the assessments. So you can really prioritize and simply see, is this an immediate, is this a midterm, is it a long-term? Um, also being able to help decipher what some of these incentives are and being able to apply them and coordinate with the contractors. So getting that all together and reducing those barriers so that we can get successful projects completed. Right now, our main focus is with a grant that the City of Madison received from the Public Service Commission, the Office of Energy Innovation, provided a $250,000 grant to the City of Madison with Sustain Dane, Elevate, and Northside Planning Council as the implementers of that grant. We're working on upgrading 80 units of NOAA housing on the north side, and we have 20 units, which was in our demonstration year on the southwest side. Uh, Northside Planning Council is our outreach partner for the north side. So what we're doing is we're actually providing 100% coverage for the upgrades. Um, we're trying to reduce that barrier of cost and kind of demonstrate to the PSC some more innovative approaches 
to make this work happen because we know we have to get it done. We're talking about you know 10 years that we have right now to address climate change. Um, we just you know we made a, a point that you know let's let's take down that barrier and make this happen. So we're providing grants or covering the costs of upgrades in the $10,000, $20,000 range. We also do you know small loan amounts for above that. But this is really you know trying to move forward and have a lot of learning that can happen in this sector. We're also working to begin in building that diverse contractor group with these houses. So we have 12 properties right now that we're working with, and this is a quick snapshot of what we're finding from the assessments for where the projects are landing. So you'll see on the far right hand side, it's a number of properties that have been identified for the measures um, at their property, and then components, for instance, would be you know, how many lights need to be upgraded. So nine of the properties, you know, that really early still lights, smart strips. Um, then we go into things like rim joist insulation and air sealing, which six of the properties need it. Um, there's some equipment, refrigerators, five of the properties. And then for four of the properties, there's boiler replacement that were needed. Um, and some of the water solutions like aerators and low flow shower heads. Uh, and then you can see other measures going down like attic insulation, um, AC replacements, and one property actually just yesterday completed their wall insulation project. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Abby to take the second half. Yeah, thanks Claire. Um, this is a little wonky, but just wanted to give folks kind of a snapshot of, you know, what is it actually costing, you know, to actually do these measures? Um, you know, we kind of have these tiers of measures that we're working on in each unit in each building. Um, you know, there's kind of a low hanging fruit, which is, as you would expect, it's some insulation and lighting we have, and that's pretty much like $600 or less per unit. So this is per unit in the building. Um, where we're looking at appliances and you know some updates to their heating systems, which are a little bit more expensive, and then um, in some of them, you know, we need to replace the whole heating system, um, and that's kind of at a higher level. And we have lots of opportunities, you know, that we're finding for solar on these smaller buildings. And um, I'm going to kind of um, talk about a couple um, like specific projects that that we're engaged with right now, as well as, you know, give you a little um, highlights onto the contractor work that we're doing. Can you forward it, Claire? You have control, right? So, um, so we are um, working on decarbonizing buildings as well. And when we find opportunities, we are, um, some of the buildings on um, the owners would like to switch from either electric resistant heat. So that's like really expensive baseboard heat that you, you've probably seen like in hotels or um, into um, a more efficient heat pump system. So this is an example, we are in construction on this building right now um, in Madison. It is a um, community co-op building and um, we're installing um, a full heat pump system in this building. So this is, um, it's a dormitory style building with 24 units, huge amount of common area. And as you can see from the picture on the left, it's a really, really old building. It was built as a sorority house back in 1926. And I really don't know how much this, the system has been updated since then. So um, they're getting a whole new heating system. Um, and um, um, the, 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 the PSC grant funds um, are not being used on this. We have access to another pool of grant funds that are really specific. For electrification, so we're um, we're using those funds to help this owner, um, you know, put a more efficient and comfortable system into their building. The middle one is all the duct work that's going in, and then the the picture on the right is um, one of the heat pump systems that are um, that are going into this building. One of many. Um, next slide. Thanks. Uh, so solar, um, as both Claire and I mentioned, you know, solar is a really important part of this, and um, we're in. Con We'll be starting construction um, in, a, in a month or two on a building um, owned by Commonwealth. To, um, it's a small four unit building and we'll be putting um, solar, um, rooftop solar on this building. And what is unique about this for, um, for this housing stock is that the solar systems will be directly um, wired into each tenant meter. So every single tenant, um, in this building will have access to the solar and will have a reduced 
utility bill. Um, a lot of times solar is only put on buildings and it only helps like the hallways or the common areas of the building. So we're, um, we're working with a team to actually get this building wide in a way that um, every tenant um, will, will have access to a solar system and, um, and have their the bills reduced. Um, next slide. I think this is my last slide. Um, and Claire mentioned that we are, um, we've been working um, closely with contractors and um, for for our organizations, you know, developing um, a, a minority kind of a women minority um, owned business pool of contractors is really, really important. So um, when we started the work, you know, there weren't a lot of contractors around um, who were um, M or WBEs to do this. So we decided that we really needed to kind of start identifying those contractors, but helping them do more in the clean energy field. So we're at the early stages of um, creating a cohort of m and contractors. And the cohort will be um, um, focused on the clean energy field. Um, so some of them will be lighting, installation, um, heating and ventilation contractors. Um, through the accelerator program, we'll get them, we'll help them navigate all of the assets we have here in Madison and Dane County. We have lots and lots of small business assets to, to help these contractors, but sometimes they're just not, those assets aren't really organized in a way that the contractors can you know, readily you know, use. So we're working with those organizations to provide them kind of business help. We'll be working with um, training providers to get contractors the kind of the training they need to maybe work in weatherization or in, um, um, clean energy heat pumps or, or solar. And then um, the third pillar is um, helping them, them get some on the job training. So working with some established businesses who um, are willing to do coaching and mentoring for these smaller um, startup contractors. We're hoping to have our first cohort of contractors moving through um, the pilot accelerator this summer. So um, we're, we're pretty excited um, to, to launch that. And I think, next slide, yep. I think that's all I have. So um, thank you again. And um, it's kind of been a opp real opportunity and pleasure to talk to everybody today. Well, very interesting presentation. Thank you, Claire and Abby. Uh, for all your work on this. this is really important part of the affordable housing puzzle, sustainability, resiliency, there's just so many parts to it. Uh, Anne, we have plenty of time for questions. Any thoughts from you, Anne, before we take questions? I will open it up to the group first. Um, everybody knows I can always ask questions. So um, <laughs> if there aren't any, I'm looking around. I don't think this was mentioned in your presentation, but what is kind of the profile of the owner of these naturally occurring affordable housing developments? And what kind of data have you been able to pull and how do you find these folks? Aside from, I, I saw the North Side Business Council, but is that one of the challenges you're coming up with? <laughs> That's a huge challenge. Um, and it's one of the primary reasons that these owners, you know, don't readily, um, you know, participate in efficiency programs because they're, they're super busy. As Claire mentioned, like sometimes owning housing is like a second job for them. So they own a couple of investment properties. Um, they have a day job. Um, they're really hard to find because they're not necessarily, um, you know, on any lists, um, and and they're just super busy. And um, and sometimes they, you know, many of these owners um, like energy efficiency is not their first thing that they do every day. Um, so helping them understand like what's available and how to upgrade their buildings is super important. Um, but. I would say like community-based partners are really important to helping identify the owners um, in and taking a neighborhood approach is how we've we've been um, we've been doing this work. I saw someone text me. Pam has a question. I didn't see your little hand up there. Thank you, Abby. Go ahead, Pam. Good morning. Thanks for the presentation, ladies. Claire, you mentioned the um, list of contractors, the um, diverse contractors. Is that something that would be able to be shared with um, so many corporations and companies focusing on diversity and working with different contractors? That would be something that would be wonderful if others could have access to. 
Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say yes, right? The goal is that going through the contractor accelerator, there is work on the other side of this. So the more people <laughs> that are then interested in hiring these contractors, the better. Okay, cleaning up and stuff. Um, Julie had her hand up, Alec, and then the chat too. Oh, yeah, God. thanks, Anne. I, I put this in the chat too. Um, great presentation. Um, really in alignment with a lot of our priorities at UW Health and really, really appreciate the work. So my question was, um, it sounds like this is grant funded right now by the $150,000 grant. What are your plans for, um, how long does that grant last? What are the plans for when it runs out, et cetera? Yeah, you're, you're right. Um, 250,000 is our number right now. 250, okay, sorry, <laughs> yeah. okay. Um, and that, yeah, that grant will go through probably the end of the summer for this specific work. Uh, and we're hoping this is going to demonstrate a lot of interest for other neighborhoods and in continued funding, including federal funding that you know, ideally will be coming through. Uh, some other communities like Middleton is also planning to be mirroring this work and has it allocated funding. And it's going to be a public-private partnership, right? You know, if we uh, have more and more people that kind of understand the importance of this and the impact this can have, then we hope that there will be additional interest in supporting it. Um, Abby's done this work across the country in a number of communities. So I, I'd be interested, Abby, too, in you kind of sharing some of that trajectory that you've seen for how this grows. I think you're exactly right. It has to be a public-private partnership, um, you know, wh wherever we're working um, with this. Um, you know, we have been really fortunate to leverage not only the um, the money through the Public Service Commission and City of Madison, but also um, private philanthropy, which has, I think, a huge role to play in, um, in some of this work. So for instance, the electrification work that um, that, that case study I showed you, um, that is a, um, a combination of philanthropy and um, private capital that's actually going into that building to, to, to upgrade it. Um, and the same with um, the, the solar project. Um, so, so we spend a lot of time braiding money together for these owners. A couple of questions in the chat and this actually um, piggybacks on, you mentioned Middleton, Claire, um, from Ray asked, is this program only available for multifamily housing in Madison or can buildings outside of Madison but in Dane County be eligible? What says yes, yes, yes and yes. <laughs> yes and yes. Uh, and in our demonstration work, we, we worked with buildings in Fitchburg and in Stoughton as well. Um, you know, we just fortunately the, you know, where the, fortunately or unfortunately, where the funding came through for the upgrade work was a Madison project. So that's why I highlighted that. But yes, buildings across Dean County and across the state, um, you know, Elevate is also, um, you know, looking, you know, Abby's up north right now. Um, Eau Claire is interested in this program. So there's also other cities across the state that are interested in this work. Abby, do you want to share some about that work? Yeah, we're we're actually running. Um, we're starting um, to do some work in Eau Claire. We're just finishing up our due diligence work here, which is a lot of in, um, interviews and conversations with with stakeholders, and are starting to actually work with the stakeholders in the city to start putting um, a, a program design together. It's gonna to be very similar process, I think, to what we have here, but because of the nuances in Eau Claire, you know, they have a very, um, you know, larger percentage um, in comparison of like student housing. So there's gonna be opportunities for student housing. Um, and then we're also working with some tribal nations on kind of similar work. Thank you. Tara had asked, and feel free to unmute if you want, Tara, about um, how we connect a building owner to a contractor that fits the criteria. E email either of us, and I can also put in the <laughs> chat the, um, the website with some more information. If there's someone you think might be a good fit, and they say, tell me a little bit more. Uh, so I'll put that in the chat to the web page about the program. Thank you. And yes, please, please do share with other building owners who you think may be a good fit. I don't see any other hands up. Um, you know, it just strikes me that these small owners that have naturally occurring affordable housing are just doing such a service and so much heavy lifting that goes unnoticed in our community. And I think even just kind of shining light on this um, 
industry of <laughs> of uh, small multifamily homeowners is just such a great thing and hopefully you know encourages them to stay affordable once they know that they are offering this service. 